speaker is, is Darlene Hoffman, and uh, I've been working with Darlene for 17 years now or something yeah, like that. Ever since I left Berkeley. She came to Berkeley from uh, being a division head at uh, Los Alamos, uh, chemistry department at the university, and also working at um, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. She's always had a keen interest in uh, nuclear reactions, way to make, ways to make heavy elements, heavy element isotopes, uh, a lot of work in fission, spontaneous fission and delayed fission, and uh, all the time she's been um, very much involved with students, training graduate students, um, keeping the education thing going. Um, national prominence, she's on a, a million committees. Uh, everyone is seeking her advice for, for all kinds of things. And today she's going to give us a historical talk, Development of Transuranium Element Research in the United States. Well, thank you very much, Ken, for that lovely introduction. After 17 years, I wasn't sure whether you want to introduce me or not. <laughs> um, I'm going to try and make the slide projector work because I have many slides. And this is going to be one of the hardest talks I've ever given because in, in 20 minutes, I'm supposed to tell you about the history and, and the development of transuranium first. element. That's fine. <laughs> is there, is there a light up here? Yeah. Can somebody turn on, turn on the light over there? The no, there's a, uh, trying to trace the development of transuranium element research in the United States in 20 minutes. And that's impossible, as all of you realize. And so uh, necessarily, it's probably going to focus a bit more on Berkeley but recognize that there were there was lots of transuranium research being developed at other places. And so if I don't mention your favorite place, you'll forgive me because of the time constraints. Now we'll see if we can make the slide work. It's you, Margaret. Yeah. Everybody can see this but me now. <laughs> the problem is I'm going to I put up a little outline because Why this not? is what I wish I had time to talk about, which I could tell you all about, but I can't. But I do want to go back even a little further than uh, Gerhard did. I want to go back to the discovery of nuclear fission, elements known in thirty nine, and then briefly uh, trace some of the discoveries of the first transuranium elements and development of the Hanford process, uh, the actinide hypothesis, then the discovery very quickly of elements 97 through 106. And I'll mention super heavies because I've been interested in super heavies ever since the mic explosion. So, and that's some longer than 50 years ago. And then unexpected, this unexpected discovery. And finally, just mention super heavy elements because I know other people will be talking about them. And take a very quick glimpse at the future. If we don't get to the future, you'll get to infer the future for yourselves. <laughs> now, I had a place to do these. Um, this story properly begins, I think, with the first report of the discovery of a transuranium element, which was made by Enrico Fermi in 1934 in this Nature article entitled uh, <coughs> by his, he and Fermi and his group. And they reported finding, upon bombarding uranium with neutrons, they reported finding beta activities with these half-lives and so they thought they had discovered the first transuranium elements. Uh, the article was published in Nature in 1934 under the title, Possible Production of Elements of Atomic Numbers Higher Than 92. And it says if it were an element 93, it would be chemically homologous with manganese and rhenium. This hypothesis is supported to some extent also by the observed fact that the 13-minute activity is carried down by a precipitate of rhenium sulfide insoluble in hydrochloric acid. And I think um, Eric referred to, uh, no, it was, yeah, uh, the solubility of uranyl nitrate versus uranyl sulfate. Well, I think this is another place where Fermi lost the bet on the 
chemistry because as most of us chemists know, uh, a sulfide will tear you down most anything. And so unfortunately, they did not discover uh, transuranium elements here. And I'm a great admirer of Fermi. I heard him speak several times before his rather untimely death, and he could make even the most difficult physics concepts like nuclear beta decay seemed simple, and then I'd go away shaking my head and saying, now what did, how did he do that? <laughs> but in this case, um, it was not transuranium elements that they had seen. See, the periodic table at that time, uh, elements 93, 4, 5, 6 were placed up here under um, 93 under rhenium, 94 under osmium, and so forth and so on. Well, um, then along came Hahn and Strassmann in December 1938. They, uh, while Lisa Meitner was still part of the um, research, leading part of the research, they had actually done the neutron bombardments of uranium and kept getting more and more puzzling results. They also saw all these uh, different activities and ascribed them first to transuranium elements. But then, um, of course, Lisa Meitner was forced to flee uh, Berlin. Um, and by the time Hahn and Strassmann were conducting these experiments, she had uh, found uh, refuge in Sweden. So they, in December 38, they bombarded uranium with neutrons. and chemically separated out barium. Um, in fact, Hahn wrote her a letter saying they had seen these activities that followed barium and lanthanum and they couldn't quite believe it. Uh, she suggested they look for the complement to barium, namely krypton, and which they uh, later did. And this is the famous quote from their Nacho Wurstenschaften article of 1939 saying we as chemists, based on the described experiments, should rename the above mentioned scheme, replacing radium actinium thorium with barium lanthanum cerium. And as nuclear chemists being in some respects close to physics, we've not yet been able to take this leap, which contradicts all previous experiences in nuclear physics. And it could be that a series of strange coincidences could have mimicked our results. So you see, they were still being very cautious. I wanted to show this picture. Maybe we, I guess that's all right. Maybe we're too high here, but wanted to show this lovely picture of uh, uh, Lisa Meitner, which was taken uh, when she was around 52 in 1930, short, sometime before she had to flee. <coughs> um, she was in Sweden at Christmas time of that year. <coughs> her, her nephew, Otto Frisch, visited her in Sweden. They went out and were walking in the snow discussing these strange, re strange results uh, that had come from Hahn and Strassmann and trying to figure out what was going on. And I don't have time to go through all this, obviously, but in this one short letter uh, to Nature, they e essentially explained most of all we un understand about fission. The high total kinetic energies the division of the um, parent nucleus into two large fragments. And uh, actually, um, Lisa Meitner was the one who coined the term fission. The whole fission process can thus be described in an essentially classical way. And she likened it to fission in biological systems, the fission of the cell. And uh, so, uh, then we come back to Berkeley. Glenn Seaborg was at that time a graduate student at Berkeley. He got his PhD in 39. Uh, and he, word came, uh, he had just given actually a report to the, uh, one of their afternoon seminars on all the discoveries of transuranium elements that were being reported by Fermi, by uh, Meitner, Hannes, Grossman, and he said, uh, quoting, that 
uh, he had used one of their articles as the basis for his Tuesday research conference report on the properties of the transuranium elements, and he even considered himself a minor expert on this subject. Well, of course, when you talk about transuranium element research in the United States, you have to talk about Glenn Seaborg because it essentially all started, almost all started there. Anyway, then came the report to the Journal Club meeting in the physics department in January of 39, which traveled by word of mouth, of the identification of uh, these radioactivities which couldn't be um, uranium iso uh, transuranium isotopes. And so then Macmillan, uh, Ed Edwin Macmillan, who was a physicist working at Berkeley, and uh, decided that they should try to look at uh, the fission process and look at the kinetic energies of the fragments. And what happened was um, they found that in investigating the fission process in bombardments of uranium with neutrons, as shown there, to investigate uh, this process in bombardments of uranium, they found that there was an activity that did not uh, recoil out of these uh, thick samples of uranium oxide that they were irradiating. And so in trying to discover or learn more about the fission fragments, they actually discovered Neptunium. He asked uh, Abelson, who had just gotten his PhD at Berkeley, to join him. Um, they did chemistry on these uh, products <coughs> and uh, John Miskell referred to the oxidation reduction process and they actually uh, did, these physicists actually did chemistry and uh, showed that uh, Neptunium, first they could reduce it with uh, SO2, then they could oxidize it, they could do separations using uh, rare earth uh, fluoride precipitates and uh, that way they could show that neptunium had properties more like uranium and not uh, like uh, rhenium. And about that time, uh, Seaborg, who roomed near Macmillan in the faculty club at Berkeley, noticed that Macmillan was gone. They used to talk with each other quite a bit because they had rooms close to each other in the faculty club. And uh, so he found out that Macmillan had gone to uh, MIT to work on radar research during the war. He wrote to him and said, didn't he think it would be a good idea if they tried to investigate this further? Macmillan had started looking for the beta decay product of neptunium. But since it was mass 239, of course, that produces plutonium 239, which is very, very long life and hard to detect. So Macmillan wrote back and said, yes, he thought it would be fine. So Seaborg uh, uh, got Kenneth, Joe Kennedy, who was also an instructor there, Art Wall, who was a Seaborg graduate student, as Gerhardt told you about. Gerhardt Friedlander and Art Wall were Seaborg and Kennedy's first, actually Seaborg's first graduate students. Uh, and for reasons which Gerhardt this fact he was not able to participate in this research ultimately. So they used the 60 inch cyclotron which had just been put into service at Berkeley and um, of course the whole dis uh, invention of the cyclotron by E.O. Lawrence really was the thing that made it possible to start discovering these transuranium elements because they were able to do deuterium bar bombardments, other kinds of bombardments, and it was a much easier thing than having to use a radium beryllium source for your neutrons also. So this is the reaction they used, De deuterium 2N to make neptunium 238, and ultimately to make plutonium 238, which had alpha decays, and they measured the alpha decay as about 50 years, which wasn't too bad. Um, some long, long years later, I measured it myself with 86 and a half by a milking technique, but this was uh, not an easy experiment. Um, so 
they sh also showed that this activity was different than Neptunian, had different chemistry. They had to use a much stronger...